Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the Tuesday night sunlight service. This is Awake Part 3. And our key verse for this study is 1 Corinthians 15.34. I've kind of been reading it piece by piece the last couple of weeks, so I'll read the whole thing in its entirety here. And it reads, Awake to righteousness, and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God, I speak this to your shame. <coughs> I'm not here to speak anything to anybody's shame, but I understand what Paul is saying here. He's saying, listen guys, not everybody knows what we know, so the fact that we're still asleep to who we are, even though we've already been woken up, that's kind of shameful, that's kind of pathetic, that's kind of squandering the gift that we've been given, and that's really kind of why I wanted to do this series so that we could really kind of understand and really start walking in the fullness of the gift we've been given, which is righteousness. But like we saw last week, it's not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of God, which is the kingdom of God. It's all about really understanding who we are, where we are, and why we are here. I think those are three of the most important questions that, that we can search for answers for in our whole lives. But, but the key is, those three questions, they only have one answer. Who we are is Jesus. Where we are is the promised land, which is Jesus. And why we are here is to experience the love of the Father, which, again, is Jesus. It's all Jesus. He is the meaning of life because He is life. So when we stop looking at righteousness as something we do, and we start looking at righteousness as something that we are, I think it's going to make it uh, a little bit easier for us to stop trying so hard to wake up and to realize that, as we're going to see tonight, and, and, and I think what hopefully what we saw in, in week one of this series, is that we wake up by letting the day star, Jesus, who's already in our heart, arise in our heart. It's all about what's inside of us really coming out of us, coming through us, being filled with the fullness of what we've been given, which again, what we've been given is Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So, and, and, and that bleeds right into the next part of the verse where it says, for some have not the knowledge of God. Awaking to righteousness means understanding the knowledge that we've been given. I preached on Saturday about all truth, and we unlocked the truths that we have an unction from the Holy Spirit and we know all things. And we unlocked the truth that the, the job of the Holy Spirit is to guide us into all truth. The Holy Spirit doesn't add anything to you because the Holy Spirit is the whole deal. What the Holy Spirit is, is it's God's love receptor in us. It's what allows God's love that has always been there for us, it allows us to receive that love. It allows us to have a knowledge that passes knowledge, which is the, the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of Christ's love for us and in us and through us. That's what it means to awake to righteousness. Awaking to, to righteousness does not mean stop sinning and then you'll awake to righteousness. That's not even the issue. Sin is not the issue. See, the, the, the reason that sin is even mentioned in this verse is because I believe that, that sin is unbelief. So if you're waking up to who you really are, that, that simply means you're believing right. And then by default, if you're believing right, you're not unbelieving. So it's not stop sinning and then you'll awake to righteousness. It's when you awake to righteousness, everything else is going to just fade in, in comparison to the bright and shining glory that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that brings us to my first passage I want to read in Isaiah chapter 60. I want to read verses 1 through 5. And, and this really, I know I say this a lot, and, and I, I think part of the reason I say this a lot is because my pastor would say this a lot, but then I found out that when he was saying it a lot, it was true, and when I say it a lot, it's true, but this is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, but I want to read it in the Message Bible first, and then in the King James, because we're going to connect some dots here, and we're going to see uh, kind of really what even what the Old Testament was talking about, which was fulfilled at the cross, and, and which brought us out of the Old and into the New. So in the Message Bible, 
Isaiah chapter 60, starting with verse 1, says, Get out of bed, Jerusalem. Wake up. Put your face in the sunshine. That's more than anything. That's what it means to awake to righteousness. It means get out of the dark and into the light. Uh, th uh, in another place in the Bible, it says that we are to be in the light as, as He is in the light. It says we are to be perfect as He is perfect. It says we're supposed to find our true identity in Jesus, in God, in His love for us. That's what makes us who we really are. Not what we do, but who we are. Who's on the inside is more important than what happens on the outside. So if we have our face in the sunlight, if we're focusing on Jesus, then we're going to really, we're going to start to become what we behold. And what I mean by that is, we are already Him, we have already been conformed to His image, but the more we behold that image, the more we will understand that image. We don't need to be more like God, we need to know what we, we need to know what He looks like so we can know what we really, truly look like. That's what it's a, it doesn't say, Paul doesn't say in 1 Corinthians, he doesn't say, start being righteous. He says, awake to righteousness. He says, you're already righteous, but you need to wake up to that truth. He says, you already are complete in Christ. You just need to understand what it means to be complete in Christ. You need to understand how complete Jesus is so that you can understand how complete you are. And that's why he says, for some have not the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is, a lo is what allows us to wake up and be who we are. Putting our face in the sunlight is what awakes us out of the sleep. It's what gets us out of the darkness, so to speak. So it goes on and it says, God's bright glory has risen for you. And I like that because really what God did, he, he, in part he did it for himself, but he did it for us. He did it because he loved us. And he did it because he wanted us to be able to experience that love. He wanted us to be able to, to feel that love and, and to live in that love. He wanted his love that was always there for us to be something that we could tap into, something that we could experience, something that would empower us. Not just something that we could say, but, but something that would really, really fill us up with, with, with the same life, the same light, the same love that he is. So... His bright glory has risen for us. It goes on and it says, The whole earth is wrapped in darkness. All people sunk in deep darkness. And when you look around, that's what it looks like even today. It looks like people are miserable. It looks like people are hopeless. It looks like people are stumbling around in the dark because they don't know any better. They don't see anything that could get them out of the circumstance that they feel like they're in. And then it says... But God rises on you. His sunrise glory breaks over you. Nations will come to your light, kings to your sunburst brightness. Look up, look around. Watch as they gather, watch as they approach you. Your sons coming from great distances, your daughters carried by their nannies. When you see them coming, you'll smile, big smiles. Your heart will swell and, yes, burst. All those people returning by sea for the reunion. A rich harvest of exiles gathered in from the nations. This is so important for us to understand that one of the reasons that our gospel, quote-unquote gospel, is not drawing people is because we're not showing the light of the true Jesus. We're misrepresenting God and we're saying, you better clean up your act or God's going to continue to be mad at you. God's going to continue to punish you. When it was never about God's anger towards us or God's punishment towards us. What we're going to see tonight is that the biggest problem we have ever had, it's not what we do making God mad, it's what's right between our ears. Our carnal mind has been our greatest enemy. And that's one of the things that Jesus got rid of on the cross. He got rid of the carnal mind and he gave us the mind of Christ. He got rid of the darkness by shining his light. And that's what this uh, passage is really referring to. It's referring to the cross. Just like all of the, the Old Testament prophecies, all of the Old Testament stories, everything in the Old Testament is type and shadow of Jesus on the cross. So, so, so this passage is no different. So in the King James it reads like this. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. It doesn't say, if you arise and shine, the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. 
It doesn't say sin not so that you can awake to righteousness. It says when you figure out what has happened on the cross, this is what you're going to be able to do. And see, that's the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, the law demanded perfection. In the New Covenant, grace empowers us to perfection. In the New Covenant, we can be perfect because He is perfect and He lives in us. It's all about us resting, stop trying so hard to be somebody else, and just realizing who it is that lives in us. Who it is that's living in me is the, the sunlight, the S-O-N light. That's what's in me. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he also said, you are the light of the world. And, and the only way that works is if it's the same light. And the only way that works is if Jesus took his light and put it in us. So again, it's not about what you do. It's about who you are. It's not about what you do. It's about what Jesus did on the cross. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. The, thy light is come. This is talking about what happened on the cross. This is talking about where we are, not where we need to get to. We don't need to get to anywhere. We're already where we need to be. We just need to see it clearly. We just need the light to shine so, so we can understand that it's not dark. We can understand that I, I, I may be in the world in one dimension, but I'm not of the world because I'm the kingdom. And if the kingdom's in the world, guess what wins? The kingdom wins. If greater is he that is within me than he that is in the world then again, guess who wins? Jesus. If the fire in me is hotter than the fire that I'm in, I don't need to worry about the fire I'm in. I can go into a fiery furnace and there can be three men in there and, and then my enemy can look and look, there's a fourth man in the fire and, 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 and this, this, this pagan leader, he says, that guy looks like the Son of God. How in the world could he know what the Son of God looked like unless it was absolutely undeniable? And that's what Jesus is in us. And that's what we're going to get to again. That's why everybody runs to us when the light shines. See, when we present a gospel of, of, you know, get right or get left, when we present a gospel of an angry God who's out to get you, that's not going to make people flock to the Lord. It's going to make people run from the Lord. That's going to present a God that people are not interested in. But if we understand his true face and, and, and we see it in ourselves and we show it out of ourselves, when we just plain straight love people because of how loved we are, that's going to get people to come. Because guess what? More than anything else, man's appetite is to be loved. That's what we all want at the most base level. We want to be loved. We want to be accepted. We want somebody to tell us that we're okay. And that's what God did on the cross. He said, you're okay. I have cleaned you, I have washed you, I have presented to you to myself as a bride without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. I did all the work, and now you get all the benefits. So if God did all the work, we ought to really stop trying to do all the work. It's either finished or it's not, and I believe it is finished. And that's what we're talking about here. The ability to rise and shine comes from the light inside of us. I can't arise by myself. I, I, Adam fell asleep. And, and before the cross, we were all in Adam. We didn't have a choice. But in the exact same way, on this side of the cross, Jesus rose up. And because I'm in him, I rose up too. I didn't have a choice on that one either. So that's what we're looking at here. It says in verse 2 of Isaiah 60, it says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. This is what we really need to understand. As dark as it seems, Jesus is the light. Whatever problem you have, Jesus is the solution. It doesn't matter what it is. What, even what we're going to see, even if we're trying to talk about enemies, what we're going to see is that Jesus took care of it. He fought the war to end all wars. He got rid of the fight. He got rid of the struggle. He got rid of everything in the world that wasn't him. He's a consuming fire and he burned away all the chaff and all that remained is that fire, that love that feeds on itself and feeds on itself and expands as we get so full of it that we understand that we can't contain it. So it goes on in verse 3 and it says, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about, and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. 
Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. When we understand whose heart it is that beats in our chest, the heart of God that beats with love, our heart's going to be so big that it's not going to be in our chest, it's going to burst out of our chest. Guys, I'm convinced that when we get so full of what we've been filled with, we're not even going to have to try to do anything. We're not going to have to try to let Jesus do anything. He's going to be so full in us that He just comes out all on His own. He just comes out naturally. And, and really, on this side of the cross, that's what's natural. Uh, before the cross, whatever Adam did was natural because he was our natural father. But on this side of the cross, whatever Jesus does is natural. Because as all died in Adam, all are alive in Jesus. So again, it's not about what you do, it's about where you, where you came from, it's about who you are, it's about whose DNA you have, who your daddy is. It's not about what you're doing on the outside, it's what, about what God did on the inside. That's where this all flows from. That's where this all comes from. It comes from the heart. It comes from flowing together. It comes from unity of spirit where, where again, I don't even have to try to line up with you because if I'm lined up with God and you're lined up with God, we're automatically lined up with each other. And then I don't have to worry about it because God's got it covered. And that's what he did on the cross. Is he, he, he literally he took care of it all. He got rid of everything that could keep us from him because, again, no, the, 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 the problem was is that we were running from Him. And, and that's what we're going to see again in a minute. We thought God was mad at us and we didn't want punishment. We didn't, we didn't want to deal with that. So, so even way back in the garden, Adam hid himself from the presence of God. The presence of God didn't go anywhere. The presence of God is everywhere. So how, how could it go anywhere? How could you leave His presence unless you're hiding from it? But that's the problem we find ourselves in. We say, if God's mad at me, then you know what? I better I better stay away from church until I get right with God. Or, or you know, I, I, I better clean up my act. But guys, you can't clean up your act and you don't need to because Jesus cleaned it up. And when we see that, we will start to be that. And when we understand the work that he did, we're going to stop trying to finish the work. All we have to do to enter in, as we saw last week, when God made a covenant with himself, he said, I'll include you in this covenant through your faith. That's our only work, and that's what Jesus said in another place. The work of, a new, of the new covenant is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, to believe that He is who He says He is, to believe that He did what He said He did, and to believe that it means for us what the Bible says it means for us. And what the Bible says it means for us is that Jesus became sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God. So once again, that's not what we do, that's who we are. We're not just living in the kingdom, we're not just living out of the kingdom, we are the kingdom. So, I wanted to read that one backwards. I usually read the King James and then the message, but I think the King James Version takes me right to my next point, which is in Genesis chapter 1, and what we're talking about in, in, in Isaiah, what we're talking about when we're looking forward to the cross, darkness, and then the light. And that's exactly what it says in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, starting with verse 1, in the King James it reads, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, which the heaven is your mind and the earth is your body. So in the beginning God created you. It's a big, uh, eternal, universal story, but it's also a specific individual story. And the earth, or, or, or you was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. This is where most of us really, honestly, truly still are. Even a lot of Christians are still in this place, where it's too dark for us to see how things really are. It's too dark for us to see who we really are. We're still sleepwalking through our lives, just in the same way that Adam died when he ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We've been walking dead men this whole time because we don't know the life that's inside of us. And if you don't know that you've been given a gift, there's no way that you can partake of that gift. If you don't know who Jesus is in you, then you're going to continue to try to find that love somewhere else. But you're not going to be able to find it. There's only one thing that can make the darkness flee, and it's the light. And that's what it says, uh, as it goes on, it says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So even when it was dark, God was still there. 
That's why Jesus could say, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus could say, I've been with you the whole time, you just didn't know it. You've been so busy running away from me, trying, trying to keep a bunch of laws, hoping that it'll please me, that you've missed out the point that I've been here the whole time, and all I've ever wanted to do is have a relationship with you. All I've ever wanted to do was love you in the same way that my Father loves me. To show you that as we are married, as we are one flesh, as we are together in this, then the Father's love in, in Jesus is the Father's love in us. That's what makes this whole thing go. That's what makes this whole thing work. And here it is in Genesis 1 verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. When God speaks, this is what he says. This is absolutely the first recorded time in the history of history that God ever said anything. Most people say God spoke the world into existence, but that's not what the Bible says. It says he created the heaven and the earth. And then when he spoke, what he said was, Let there be light. When God spoke the word, which is Jesus, which was with God in the beginning, and which was God in the beginning, when God spoke that word, he released Jesus into the universe. Or, or again, if we're looking at this from, from an individual point of view, he released Jesus into us. And again, that's what happened on the cross. So before the cross, we were dark and sleeping, and couldn't see, and couldn't do right, and, and, and had this desire for God deep within us, because when it says darkness was upon the face of the deep, Another place in the Bible, it says the deep calls out to the deep. So even in our darkness, we, we, we yearned for something better. We yearned for a love that only the Father could give us, but we didn't know where to find it because we thought he was mad at us, because we thought it was our performance that dictated our relationship. We put more emphasis on what we did than who God is, and we're still doing that. But God had a different plan. God said, let there be light. He said, let me show you how things really are. Let me show you my face in the person of Jesus. Let, if you want to run to me, that's fine. I'll come down to you and I'll chase you down and I'll draw you to myself, literally drag you to myself on the cross. I'll do all the work to make a way between myself, God, and, and, and creation, mankind. God said, I'm going to do it all because you can't do it. And, and really, at that point in time, we didn't want to do it. We wanted something that made sense to our carnal minds where we could say, okay, if I do good, then I'll be blessed. If I do bad, then I'll be punished. That makes sense to human beings, but that's not God. God is good all the time because God is love all the time. God does not love. God is love. That's not a characteristic of God. That's the definition of God. So what we see here is in our darkness, he gave us his light. Wherever we were at, whatever pit you were in, what, wherever you think you're at right now, it's not bad and getting worse. You just aren't looking at it clearly. Because if you're looking at anything other than Jesus, you've missed the whole point of existence. Eternal life is knowing the Father and the Son. That's what we are here for. We are here to be loved by God, to be in relationship, to be in fellowship with God. All throughout the Old Testament, God says over and over and over again, He says, I will be your God and you will be my people. That was God's heart cry. Our heart's cry was, was somehow somebody please love me. And God was saying, I already do. But i got to get you to see that. I've got to get you to stop looking at me the wrong way so you can stop looking at yourself the wrong way so that we can enter into a relationship. The Bible says in another place, it says, can two walk together if they are unequally yoked? And the answer is no. So if we think God's way up here and we think we're way down here, we're never going to be able to walk with him. We're never going to be able to fellowship with him. We're never going to have the relationship that he wants us to have. So what he did was he came all the way down as low as we could go and he brought us all the way up to where he's at. That's why the Bible says we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Again, it doesn't say we will be someday if we do enough good stuff. It says that's where we're at right now. Seated in a posture of rest in Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Equally yoked. Cleaned. Washed. All of these things. Transformed. All of these things. What it means is we are now Jesus because he became us, and then died, and then rose again. See, I, I, I really want to try to help people understand that Jesus did not come to improve you. He came to remove you, and fill you with himself. 
And once he did that, then what else do you need? Now you've got it all, and now you know you've got it all. And that's what the Holy Spirit does, is it, 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 it guides us into all truth. It, it explains to us all things that we already know, which again is the love of God. So in verse 4, it says, And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God made a distinction between day and night. He made a distinction between awake and asleep. He made a distinction between the living and the dead. He said, listen, there's two options. And, and, and on the cross, he made the, the better option available to us. He said, you know, I set before you life and death blessings and cursings, and he said, choose life. He said, I'm not going to force life on you, but I'm going to make it available, and if you want it, just let it shine, because I'm putting it in you. I'm planting that seed, that incorruptible seed in you, but it's up to you what you do with it. If you want it, it's yours. Now, it's again, I've been referencing this verse a lot, but that's why Jesus says in Revelation, I stand at the door and knock. He's not going to barge his way in, but if you answer the door, if you, if you just really start to believe, if you wake up, to what is true, then you can start to enjoy all of these things that, that are culminated in the person of Jesus. So, in the Message Bible it reads, First this, God created the heavens and earth, all you see, all you don't see. Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, and inky blackness. And again, I think that's how we feel most of the time. We feel this bottomless emptiness inside of us. We feel this hole that, that we don't know how to fill. Solomon wrote a whole book about it, try, trying to find life under the sun. And, and he came to the conclusion that all is vanity. Because under the sun, you're not going to find what you're looking for. You can only fill that God-shaped hole inside of you by being in the sun. S-O-N. And again, what, what, what we need to understand is that that hole was filled on the cross. You don't even have to fill it. You just have to believe that Jesus did what he said he did. You just have to believe that we are where we are, who we are. You just have to believe that God loves you. And then his love becomes real for you. So it says, God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. God spoke light and light appeared. God saw that light was good and separated light from dark. So again, this is, the, this and, and, and to be clear, the darkness, it also came from God, but there's a difference between something coming from God and something being of God. Because uh, the Bible says in another place, it says, all good and perfect gifts come from the Father. So, so even though we understand that God created everything, and He created everything for purpose, on purpose, and by purpose, at the same time, he also created something better, a more excellent way. And, and, and really, he didn't create a more excellent way. He is the more excellent way. So, so when, 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 he, when, when you see the world or, or the natural, and then you see the kingdom or, or the super, what we understand is that God elevated us to a supernatural state, to, to, to being more human than human. And, and, and again, that's what Jesus was. Jesus experienced life on a level that, that most of us can only dream of. But the trick here is that we can have it because he gave it to us. That's why the, the promised land flows with milk and honey. That's the best quality of life that you can have on every level. Eternal life is not just about length of days. It, it's, it's, it's about having so much life every day that, that how many days you have is not even the issue. So again, it's not, it's not what you have or what you do. It's who you are. It's who lives in you. It's having that life in you so that you can truly live, so that you can walk in the day. So now I want to uh, shift a little bit and, and focus on the fact that our biggest problem, I believe, with awaking to righteousness is that we don't think we're righteous. We cannot believe that we are the righteousness of God. And in Psalm 68, verse 1, it says, Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. And I won't say I always had a problem with this verse, but I always wondered about this verse because I wondered who in the world could be God's enemy. Who in the world would, would, would God have to worry about? 
And I understand that he fought for the people of Israel all throughout the Old Testament. But, but again, those were the people of Israel's enemies. Those weren't God's enemies. So, so this verse always kind of just, just you know, it, it made me kind of raise an eyebrow and be like, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. What are we talking about here? What we're talking about here is Colossians 1.21, which says, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind, by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. We thought we were God's enemies. Right from the jump. Adam thought, I've sinned, God's mad at me. He's good, I'm evil. That's what Adam knew. That's the tree he ate from. In Adam's mind, he thought he was God's enemy. And what that's what it says here. It says, we're sometimes alienated from God and enemies from God in our minds by our wicked works. We let what we do influence what we think about God. When really what we need to do is we need to we need to really let who God is influence what we do. We need to take it the other way. We're always looking at things backwards. We think the kingdom is upside down and backwards, but really the kingdom is right side up and frontwards. And we've been going about this backwards the whole time. We've been stumbling around in the dark saying, man, I really screwed up. God must be mad at me. When God was saying, if you knew who you were, maybe you wouldn't have screwed up. If you knew how much I loved you, maybe you wouldn't be looking for it in other places, and maybe you wouldn't be sowing seeds to the flesh and reaping corruption. God's saying, maybe if you knew who the true sower was, maybe if you knew what the true seed was, maybe if you could wake up and put your face to the sunlight and see things how they really are, you would see, I'm not your enemy. You wouldn't have to run from me, and instead you could run to me. So that, I believe, is the enemy that Psalm 68 verse 1 is talking about. And when God arises, that's the enemy that gets scattered. Not you and not me, not our wicked deeds, but our mindset. Our carnal mind that is at enmity with God is what flees. The darkness is what flees in the light that is Jesus. How we see God clearly will dictate how we react to God. And, and, and again, if you see him as an angry dictator, you're probably going to run away from him because you probably think, look how terrible I've acted. Look how mad he has to be at me. I've got to be his enemy if I keep doing this, this, and this. But when God arises and his enemy is scattered, then we understand that, listen, I may have messed up, but that does not mean daddy doesn't love me. We can stop looking at him as an enemy or, 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 or as a master or, or, or even worse as a taskmaster and we can start clearly seeing him as our father and that's who he really is. That's one of the, the very few ways that God has chosen to reveal himself to us is the relationship between a father and a son. And as a father of a two-year-old son, I can tell you it doesn't matter what Logan does, I'm not his enemy. I love him, period. He does stuff I don't like. Yeah, that's true. I get mad at him sometimes. Yeah, that's true. But again, if, if I, being evil, know how to give good gifts to my child, how much more my Heavenly Father knows to give them to me? His love surpasses my love. So, so if I can get a glimpse of it through my own relationship, then, then listen, guys, I'm telling you, I will never, ever, ever be my son's enemy, ever. Even if he thinks I am, he's going to be wrong. And, and when I rise up and show him who I really am, then my enemy, quote-unquote enemy, his mindset, it's going to scatter. It's going to flee. He's not going to look at me the, as, as somebody who's out to get him when he understands that I'm on his side. And that's why God died for us. That's literally, think about that for a second. That's why God died for us. So that we could see his love clearly. So that we could see how much he loves us. So we could see the, the, the lengths that he was willing to go to reconcile us back to himself. Even though we are the ones who ran, even though we were the ones who could always come back, he said, no, listen, if this is how you're going to see me, I'm going to do something to show you who I really am. And what he did to show us who he really was is he literally became who we are, died the, one of the most brutal, painful, humiliating deaths that you can die. And then he rose again, and he gave us his life. He didn't want us to have regular life. He wanted us to have resurrection life. He wanted us to have the Holy Spirit so we could be loved by him, so we could know we are loved by him, so we could receive and experience his love. And that's what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. It says, For if 
when we were enemies, which again, what we just saw is that we were only enemies in our minds because of our wicked works. We thought we were enemies with God. We thought He was mad at us. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. See, most of the time we look at our salvation and we look at it from the point of view of, I was saved by God's death. I even hear people say this all the time. They say, well, God died so you could have a life. And guys, that's not true. Jesus died on the cross not so that you could have a life. Jesus died on the cross so that you could have a death. In the book of Hebrews it says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Jesus kept that appointment, both for us and as us. If we died in Him, that means we were judged in Him. That's where our righteousness comes from. Not anything that we did, not anything that we can do, but who He is and what He did. Jesus says in another place, He says, The Father has committed all judgment unto me. And for a while I thought that that meant, okay, that means Jesus is the judge. But that's not what it means. It means what happens is God, all of God's judgment falls on the Son. It's in the exact same way that, that even God foreshadowed it in the Old Covenant, where, where when, when somebody sinned, they brought, a sinless, they, they brought a spotless lamb, and the lamb was judged, the lamb was looked at, the, the, the sinner just stood by and he hoped his sacrifice was worthy. In the same way, it, we're not judged except that we're judged in Him. And that's the best judgment you can get because remember what we saw in Isaiah is the glory of the Lord, the light is shining for us. God's judgment for us is not in the negative, it's in, it, it's in our favor. God has judged you righteous. God has judged you blessed. God has judged you His Son, a co-heir with Christ. Everything, God, the Bible says the Father loves the Son and has committed all things into His hands. God gave Jesus everything. He gave Him the good, the bad, and the ugly. Jesus took the bad and buried it, and then kept the good, and, and then after God gave Jesus everything, God gave Jesus to us. He gave us everything in Jesus. So again, awaking to righteousness, it's not about what we do, it's not about what we want, it's not about anything except what we have. And what we have is Jesus. He lives in me, and that's how I live this life in the flesh. I don't live it at all. I just get out of the way and let Jesus do what He wants to do. I don't try to manufacture righteousness through my actions. I let the righteousness that I am flow out of me naturally. My heart gets so big that I can't contain it and it just bursts out all over the place. That's what happened again when God said, let there be light. He filled the darkness with light and, and, and if you're so full of light, there's no room for darkness. If you are full of your true identity, which is righteousness, that's why you sin not. That's not how you sin not. That's why there's no room for it. If you're full of light, there's no room for darkness. If you're full of Jesus, there's no room for Adam. If you understand that Adam died on the cross and was buried and is not coming back, cannot come back, Adam's not the issue, sin is not the issue, if you can stop dragging that corpse of the old man around you, around with you, then that's called walking in the day. That's called living an abundant life. An abundant life is not toil and sweat. That was the curse that the earth was placed under when Adam disobeyed God. He said, you're going to earn your bread by the sweat of your brow. And then Jesus came and sweat great drops of his blood and reversed the curse and said, listen guys, not only do you not have to earn bread by the sweat of your brow anymore, but Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said, what you've been trying to get the whole time is me. He said, you look in the Bible and you try to find eternal life, but it speaks of me. Jesus said, if you would just get your eyes off anything else and just keep them on me, you would find that everything that you need is everything that I am. God's love is greater than we could ask for or even think. And He gave it to us. He lavishes it on us. He filled us up past overflowing with it. Because if you think one body can, can contain God's love, it can't. And that's why Jesus, as one body, sacrificed Himself, gave us His Spirit so that we could be a many-membered body. Love always keeps expanding. Light always keeps expanding. The kingdom is a never-ending kingdom. 
is not going to stop because you're in a bad mood. If it's in you, it's coming out of you. And that's what another thing that, that, that awakening to righteousness means. It means understanding that you cannot give something you don't have. In the old covenant, it was forgive in order to be forgiven. In the new covenant, it's forgive because you are forgiven. Again, the law demands that you do things that, that, that really that you can't do. But the new covenant, grace, empowers you to do things because they're already done. Because Jesus did them for you and as you. Jesus was not only, Jesus was not only judged for us and as us, but Jesus is our judgment. He's everything. He's, he, he's literally the mercy seat. It, it, again, in the old covenant, it was a judgment seat where what you did was what defined you. In the new covenant, it's a mercy seat where who lives in you defines you. That's why, that's why we've been talking the, the, this whole time in, in, in Word Without Walls about how, how we are the house that God lives in. We are the kingdom. We are the dwelling place. That, listen, Jesus is not up in heaven. Make, the carpenter Jesus is not making you a house to live in. He, on the cross, he made you a house for him to live in. And, and the more light that you shine on that, the more you're going to see yourself as you truly are when you see him as he truly is. That's why it's, uh, I got, I said all that kind of in a roundabout way to say, it, it's not his life, I mean, it's not his death that saved us. It's his death that killed us. It's his life that saved us because it's his life that sustains us. It's his life that took us from, from, from where we were after, after he died as us. And then he rose again as us. He said, listen, now all that stuff that you cared about, all that stuff that, that the Bible says that you're ashamed of, that no good fruit came from, all that stuff you tried so hard to build your own kingdom, none of that stuff matters anymore. All that stuff's dead and gone. The old has passed away and all things are become new. And that's what Jesus' life is. Jesus says four times in the book of Revelation, that he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And, and I just did a rant series on this, and, and, and what I found more than anything is the end, it, that is Jesus, it's not in your future, it's in your past. The end was the cross. That's where everything ended, and, and that's where everything started new. So, so what I was saying in my rant series was Jesus is the beginning and the end and the new beginning. He's the new man, the new creation. He's who we are now. He's where we are now. He's why we're here now. To experience the love of the Father. To, to awake to righteousness. To, to, to stop trying so hard to be somebody. And, 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 and to just rest in the truth that we're already Him. We've already arrived. We're already awake. So if we'll stop sleepwalking, we, we, we can really enjoy how great it is to be awake. And that's what it says in Romans 5. It says, when we were enemies in our minds, he died to kill that mind. And he gave us his mind, the mind of Christ, the heart of God, the Holy Spirit. He gave us a new way of seeing, a new way of thinking. He gave us, a, uh, in the Song of Solomon, it, it talks about having dove's eyes, which means seeing with the Holy Spirit. And then a little bit later, it talks about being the dove. So first you see it, and then you be it. It's a progression or, 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 or a maturing process where, where you're learning about who you are, which is what really what, what the New Testament writers, what they talked about more than anything, it, it is the knowledge of Christ. We don't need any more Jesus. We can't get any more Jesus. He gave us all of himself. So what we need is knowledge of what we have. What we need is knowledge of who we are. But again, it's not a head knowledge, it's a heart knowledge. It's a knowledge that passes knowledge. It's the knowledge of love, which only comes from the Holy Spirit, our love receptor, which is what allows God to say what He's always said, which is, I love you, but it allows us to hear it. It allows us to see God clearly as a loving Father, rather than as an angry taskmaster. That's what awaking to righteousness does. It, 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 it's not changing things. It's just waking up to how things really are. It's not getting me out of the world and into the kingdom because that happened 2,000 years ago. I don't need to get anywhere. I don't need to get anything. I just need to figure out what I have, what I am, where I am. 
I just need to be able to look in the mirror with an unveiled face. With a face that doesn't have a stone or, or, or the law or, or anything, any mindset, any thought. Uh, in, in John's letters to the churches, he, he, he described the, the Antichrist as anything or, or, or anybody that denies Jesus, period. So, so that's the enemy. The thoughts in our minds that say Jesus isn't who he said he is, that Jesus didn't do what he said he did, and that we're not who Jesus says we are. That's the difference between day and night. That's the difference between light and dark. That's the difference between a lie and the truth. If, if Jesus is all truth, then anything other than him is a lie. Period. If Jesus is the light, anything other than him is dark. So again, what God did was he took us when we were dark and he gave us the light. And he said, here it is. If you want it, you can have it. If you want it, just let this mind of Christ that's in you be in you. If you want it, you already got it. You don't have to do anything to get it. And, and that's the tragic part about what I see in, really again in most people, including Christians, is that we're trying and trying and trying to get what we've already got. And if you're trying really hard to get something you've already got, then you're not enjoying it. You're not enjoying what you have. If somebody gives you a gift but you think you have to earn it so you go out and work, you're not enjoying the gift. It's going to waste and you're wearing yourself out. And you're never going to get to the place where you feel like you've earned it. The carrot is always going to move a little bit further away. There's always going to be one thing you lack. Because again, if you're trying to earn something that you are already have, that's impossible. You cannot earn a gift. Paul says in another place, he says, if you have to earn it, it's not a gift, it's wages. And the wages that the Bible talks about are the wages of sin, which is death. Which, which again is not to say if you sin, you will die. What it's saying is, uh, before the cross, in the darkness, you are dead in your sins and trespasses. They go hand in hand. It's, it's not necessarily for, it's like for Adam it was an if-then situation. God said, if you eat from this tree, you will die. And because of that, we were born dead. We were born in sins and trespasses on that side of the cross. But again, that's what Jesus came and did away with. He did away with that whole mindset of good and evil. He did away with that whole mindset of enemies. That's why the Bible says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who can be his enemy? And, 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 and if there is an enemy, which is an antichrist mindset, which is thinking that we're an enemy, let God arise and his enemies will be scattered. If you're full of God, you're not full of thinking he's mad at you. If you're full of God, you're full of love. Period. So, so as we continue to talk about awaking, I had a lot more that, that I didn't think we'd have time to get into, and I'm going to save it for next week, but let me say it like this. To set up next week, 1 Corinthians 15.26 says, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So again, when we're talking about an enemy, when we're talking about a mindset, when we're talking about thoughts towards God that are not accurate about God, that's death. And that's what we're going to look at next week. We're going to look at the fact that Jesus came to wake us out of sleep. Jesus came not to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people alive. And that's what he did on the cross. And that's where I believe the last enemy was destroyed. But, but we'll look at it that next week. What I really want to hit for tonight is we awake by letting God arise. And when God arises, his enemies are scattered. When we were enemies, he reconciled to us back to himself by his death. And then after he reconciled us back to himself, he gave us his life. He gave us his light. He gave us himself. And that is really, truly what it means to be in the kingdom, to, to be the kingdom. That's what it means to awake to righteousness, to be your true self, to live an abundant, everlasting resurrection life. It means you're not living it at all. Jesus is living it in you. Amen.